Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how I recreated Forget Me by Louis Capaldi. I'm gonna show you my thought process behind picking a piano sound that works well with other mid-range elements like pads and synths, a recent thing that I've been doing for writing bass parts, and some fun sound design stuff for modern pop singer-songwriter stuff. But before we get into any of that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I work as a remote indie pop producer under the name Velvet Year. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how to create their own music at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you watch this video and you think we might have fun working on a project together, check out the top link in my description. All right, now onto the rest of the video. So I went through and color coded all of these guys. So I guess we will start from the top, which is the piano. So this piano is very personal, but it's very, I don't know how you describe it, almost like intimate, but then it's like really slammed with compression. And the two main factors that I was thinking about when recreating this piano sound was A, the kind of piano I was using. So I was using addictive keys on their modern upright. Looks like a front stereo was the preset that it was on. And for this kind of sound, I prefer more of an upright piano than an actual grand piano. You can compare the two kinds of them together and you can hear that they're different. But for me, for less concerty stuff, more singer songwriter stuff, uprights almost always are my preferred sound. Another way that I wanted to get that sound was in how I arranged these chords. So in this verse section and this chorus section, the MIDI is pretty much exactly the same. Only here I have the chords playing in the left hand. It's just a root and a fifth for all of them. And then when we get to the really drivey section, I've taken those chords that were a root and a fifth and I've transposed them an octave down and then added another root of the chord on top of it. And it just adds that sort of chunkiness to it. They're also hitting a bit harder on the velocity side, which is also another way to add sort of a, a transition point between piano parts is go to the MIDI here near the end and lower the velocities so that there's almost like a soft transition before you go into the slappy part. So I just took these last few notes, made them really soft, and then made this last hit here on the four really hard. And it just makes this dynamic piano arrangement that feels more like somebody that's like sitting at a piano playing something and having fun. In terms of processing, I threw on some multiband compression just because it kind of levels out some of the, the mid-range hump that happens when you really dig into a piano. Like it just sort of tames that initial attack. And I did that first because I knew I was gonna be throwing it into some more compression, specifically with this glue compressor and some Moti T. And I didn't want to go as hard on these because I don't really like the sound of like super insanely compressed pianos in this context. So what I did was I leveled it out from a frequency standpoint with this first so that it could go into these two guys and I wouldn't have to use them as harshly. So if I take off all that compression. with it on. Then use some EQ to sort of shape it in the mix and a little bit of fresh air because I wanted some more shine on it, which leads really well into the next section, which are all of these, what I would call like chordal elements. So we start off with our pads, which sound like this. Really fun, really weird. It starts out with this first one, which is a basic Pantheon patch in arcade just doing a root and a fifth. And then underneath that, I've started messing around with this vintage synths line a bit more. So this is the realign preset. And then I'm also using another patch on realign. This patch was also kind of dynamic from a frequency standpoint. So I also used some C4 to sort of level it out. You can see that as it gets farther into the loop, that mid-range band is really pulling it down, which makes it really even from a frequency standpoint, which is what I love. And then some low-pass filtering on pretty much all of them, running into some reverb. For this, I just use some basic ROM and then a basic ping-pong delay on Ascend. These guys were made to sort of be like ethereal floatiness. It's very subtle in the original track, but it's almost meant to like fill up that mid-range whenever you don't have that sort of harsher attack from the piano, as well with those guys there's a really subtle layer of like guitar choppiness below it which sounds like this 
it doesn't sound exactly like this, but I wanted to get that sort of texture flowing in it. It's very subtle in the original recording. So we just have some basic Strat lead lines playing happening right now into the Prince and a Rain preset on guitar rig with the studio reverb turned off. And then we have some trans gate to add some rhythmic variety to it. So when I turn it off, then when I turn it on, It's sort of stuttery almost, very simple, but it almost adds rhythm to it like it's a percussion layer. And then underneath that, we have the same thing, but doing some chords. And then all of these layers together sound like this. And you can hear there's a lot of mid-range happening here. And that is kind of and something you need to keep in mind when you're doing a lot of stuff that's sort of mid-range heavy is it is sort of in danger of taking over the piano completely. So to get around that, A, I did some EQing here on the bus, high passed it really high and then cut out some of like the 1K because 1K and 2K are always, there's always too much of it in some places. But then I also used track spacer here, focusing mainly here and it's side chain to the piano. So if I solo the piano with these guys and play them, It just guarantees that the piano isn't going to get stepped on in the mid range and that it can cut through. If I was doing this track with a vocal on top of it, I would probably do it more to the vocal because I feel like that's more important. Here it sort of added like a gradient layer underneath the track. And then we have the bass. So for this one, I just used my Music Man. And as you can see, there are certain parts of the bass that are like punched in. Nothing like hyper impressive, but basically what I do is when I'm writing bass lines, I will start out doing, I would consider to be the basic part, which is the root of the chord that you're playing. And I'll do that on one track and then underneath it, I'll actually have a duplicate track. So after I've done those sort of root chords, that's where I'll go in and add these transition points. And in those transitions, I'll either use what I call a fill, which is something like this, which isn't really related to the sort of lower chord stuff. It's kind of like a higher lead note, or I'll do something that's more of like a walking bass line like this. It just sort of walks from this chord into this chord as like a transition point, making it feel like one big thing. So yeah, if you're having trouble writing bass lines, I would start with getting your roots set and then on a separate track coming up with fills and transitions. Honestly, for me, since I'm more of a guitar player, what I will do sometimes is I will actually play a guitar through like an octave pedal, a couple octaves down, and that can really help when trying to come up with fills that feel like they fit. It's a cerebral thing, but sometimes it helps. In terms of process, we're just using like the DI feeder preset with not as much distortion because I wanted to add a little bit of my own. So we're using some soft tube, just a little bit on the low end, just because I felt like there needed to be some more honkiness to it. General tone shaping EQ, and then a track spacer and compressor side chain to the kick. So we get this really nice low end that is sustained through the bass after the kick hit, but it's not blending on top of the kick. Underneath that, we have the drums, which starts out with this kick drum which is BBL Kick Anna. It's this one here from the Bedroom Beats Lo-Fi Hack on Splice. I like this pack a lot because you can get a lot of modern sort of EDM style stuff in terms of like sustained mid-range and low end without that sort of like really harsh, clicky high end that sometimes plagues samples that have those characteristics. Underneath that, we have our first snare which is actually from the sequel pack. Just got a bit of a thwack to it, but a little bit of a high-end spit. And then I needed to add some body below that. So I added this neon pop snare clean underneath it. I used that same trick that I showed you guys previously where you can use Pro Q3 and then just sort of hover your cursor here and it'll show you where the resonant frequencies of that snare drum are. And I use that to make sure that the fundamentals of both of the snares were in the same place. I know that there's debate about whether or not it's helpful to tune them to the key of the song, which is a totally stylistic choice. But in my opinion, the main point is making sure that your drum samples are tuned in unison with each other. Not all of them uniformly, but like if you're doing stuff like layering snare drums on top of each other, I think probably one of the biggest detriments to people 
layering snare samples on top of each other is their fundamentals are just not the same. Like you can see now that it's on an E, but that's after I tuned it three semitones. So it was originally a C sharp. So this snare was almost adding like a lower minor third to my existing snare drum. And that was sort of like making them clash. It's kind of hard to hear if you don't know what it sounds like. But if you get two samples that are really in tune with each other, and then you slowly move one out of tune with the other, you'll hear there's almost like this fluttering, like when a guitar string is out of tune, there's this sort of like fluttery thing. And it's kind of annoying. And it makes the drums stand out as being like two specific drums. Whereas when they're in tune with each other, it feels like one cohesive sound. Underneath that, I wanted to get some hi-hats going. So I actually bought this uh, drum pad here specifically for scenarios like this. So I have a couple of sticks here and I felt like one of the main factors to the grooviness of this beat was this rhythm that the hi-hat was sort of going for. Da 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 And like if you were to draw this in from a MIDI standpoint, you would see that it's kind of just straight 16th notes, but the ghost notes are what are actually adding that variety. And in my experience as a drummer, if you have at least some ability to play it, it can just keep stuff from sounding really stale. Like if I take all of these sounds, the exact same MIDI, and I just dime the velocity. Like it sounds robotic, obviously, versus I just feel like that's a lot more fun. For this, I'm using the Rock Solid Easy X in Superior Drummer. Normally, if I'm doing something like this where I'm just using the hi-hat, normally I will turn the hi-hat up as loud as it needs to be and then sort of blend in how much of the room mics I want. I left it unrendered here because I wanted to be able to show you guys what I was doing. But normally, honestly, after I get this general blend down in a project, I'll just go here and freeze the track and render it out as audio because I've personally never found there to be any benefit of like keeping the original original sound ready to go just in case. Like I, I personally have more fun when I just commit to stuff. It, it's almost like the thing where when you're taking a test, your first answer is probably the highest chance of being correct. And the longer you allow yourself to second guess yourself, the more likely you are to stray away from the right answer. I also did some fun stuff here with some transient shaping. So I boosted the attack overall, but then as you can see, I actually automated the sustain. So when it's over here in the verse section, it's minus 14. So it's making that a little bit shorter. And then when it gets here to the chorus, it's actually 42% positive. And this is one of my favorite ways to sort of replicate the way that a drummer will naturally get a bit looser with their hi-hat when they're in a chorus and how they get tighter on a verse. So into... And it's just a really quick way to manipulate a sample that you already have instead of going through a folder and trying to find another sample that doesn't sound like a completely different hi-hat. But then after that, I did some general shaping and then some soothe on these higher frequencies because there was this annoying like 15K range that I really didn't like. And then the last stop we have here is the percussion. So I actually saved an instance of this for you guys to see. I felt like there were a lot of these sort of sparse sound design production layers in the percussion. The way I went about recreating that was this guy. This is one of my favorite lines from Arcade that I actually haven't used in a while. It's called Instead of Hi-Hats. And I just found this tiny trees preset that has like a lot of really nice sounds that I felt were kind of in the style of the sound design element I was looking for. And so what I did was I went through, found one of the samples that I felt would work well in the beat. Then I would just duplicate that track, delete the MIDI and go through again and start seeing if there were any other sounds that I thought would also work. And I just did that a bunch of times and then just bounced them down to audio. And from there, you can do some quantizing of the audio and some transient shaping. So the first one we have is this guy. Almost like a scratchy, like trap hat. Then we have this filler layer. Then we have these guys here like very percussive, almost like tapping on like a can of Altoids. Then there was also this uh, snap layer that I thought sounded really cool. So I threw it into a, a reverb send. And then this guy, this like very squishy layer. So what I did was I high passed all of like that weird mid range out of it, auto panned it so that it's going left and right. And it's adding this intrigue in the stereo field. And then I'm using one knob pumper set to half notes so that it's sort of like, like instead of this like sort of pumping sidechain thing, it sort of gradually lifts through the course of the arrangement. And then just to spice things up here at the end, we have sort of a long reverse tail. I think this is from the That Sounds pack, sort of shorter reverse into some clap impact. Honestly, if you're going to try to level up your production game, getting a folder of sounds like these that just sound good and everything is like a bonus. And then here, like on the last bar of every chord progression, there's like this one clap that comes in to double up everything. 
And yeah, that's everything. It's a pretty simple arrangement, honestly. But yeah, let's look at what everything sounds like together. That's what the final track sounds like. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you got into the point of this video, you probably did. So hit subscribe and all that stuff below. Again, I do one of these videos every Friday. If you have any other tracks that you would like me to break down, put them in the comments down below. But yeah, I will be seeing you guys next week.